Colin, I appreciate you taking the time to to chat today. I I, I love the film. I'll I'll admit my my living room got a little dusty at the end. There is definitely uh, uh, felt a few feelings here, but. Um, oh, I, well. I'm really excited to to talk to you about it for a few minutes today. Yeah, for sure, Bernard. I, I I was so interested in your your the name of your your company. I mean, it's like this invention of dreams. Like, tell me. I mean, that feels sure. so related. Like, tell me about that. <laughs> it it kind of does. So, um, there's it's actually comes from a book called The Invention of Hugo Cabret, which Martin okay. Scorsese turned into a movie called Hugo. Uh, yes. Okay. And there's a. Yeah, there's a film professor in it who wrote a book called The Invention of Dreams about uh, about George Melier in the early days of film. And I thought it was such yeah, sure. a evocative title to to use for what we're trying to what we're trying to do here. I love that. I love that. It's so good. I appreciate it. Uh, so how did you how did you come up with the idea for linoleum? Uh, you know, linoleum was born out of a, a whole lot of things. Um, it's a it's a pretty layered film, but I I think the main sort of inspiration came from my grandparents' uh, relationship, and uh, they met when they were sixteen and started dating and were together until their mid eighties when they passed away. And so that um, was uh, was really sort of this you know the the kind of initial spark for the story was trying to illustrate almost like a relationship over the course of that amount of time. So. Um, so yeah, that was the initial place it was born and it was a long writing process. So I started in about 2015 and, uh, worked on the script for maybe five years or so before we shot. So, uh, you know, one of the things that struck me is you brought together such a remarkable cast and I, I, I'm curious how, how you, how you brought together this, this particular group of people. It's wonderful. Sure. Well, our amazing casting director, Jessica Sherman, had a huge part in that. Um, she was great along the way and brought uh, about a lot of um, wonderful people to our attention. Um, and, um, you know, casting is so much fun as a director, you know, to imagine the movie in all these different ways and all these different iterations. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, I agree. I'm, I'm thrilled with the way it all turned out. Um, I, I, I kind of knew pretty early on that, um, getting a comedian to play the, the lead role was something I was very interested in doing. Um, cause there's, there's so, it's a real acting challenge. You know, you, there's so many different things that Jim Gaffigan has to do in that, in that, uh, lead role, um, that really, um, you know, it's a challenge. And, and I think, um, you know, as a comedian, I know that that he, I could, I could see evidently with his other films that he's made, he started to do some dramatic stuff that, that he can absolutely do the drama. And of course he can do the comedy, um, because of his, his skill as a stand up. Um, but this, and this, like seeing Jim as like a children's science TV show host, you know, like a Bill Nye, the science guy, like, you know, what an opportunity. Um, and, uh, of course, Ray Seaborn, who plays, um, you know, uh, his wife and this brilliant scientist, uh, you know, engineer, uh, who's going through her own midlife crisis, uh, in a major way. Um, uh, uh, she was such a good sport and we had some great conversations going into it. Um, we shot during early, early COVID. And so, um, none of these actors were working. In fact, almost nobody was, but almost nobody even wanted to, you know, there was risk mm -hmm. involved with that, but we, we obviously took it very seriously and, um, did all the testing and so forth, had no cases of COVID or anything, but, um, but yeah, casting was, was interesting in the age of COVID as well. So, um, yeah. Jim has a you know particularly difficult role here with the, with the, the two different parts. And, and I was curious how you went about working with him to, to build out the distinctions in the two characters. Of course, of course. Um, it's funny how we had, we had conversations with it early on, you know, as we were first meeting up and, um, but <laughs> Oddly enough, like right when we went into, we went into hair and makeup and did some tests um, with like the, the mustache and the, the hair pieces that he wears as the other character. And interestingly enough, I feel like that's pretty much all we had to do. Like <laughs> all the, all the conversations, like, like, um, didn't, it was like, he put that stuff on and the, and the, the sort of like suit costume and so forth. And he was just immediately that, that character, um, in a way that I think, uh, almost scared himself, you know? Um, you know, it was like to the point where like, I didn't even really want to eat lunch with him when he was like in that, <laughs> in that vibe. Um, but, uh, but he was a real good sport about it. And I think we developed it, um, you know, in this way of having conversations about, you know, our own experiences growing up, uh, you know, with our, with our own fathers and, 
and so forth. And not that my father was anything like this character, but of course, you know, um, the fathers are intimidating. And I think that that, that comes down, it's sort of like elevating that aspect of it. And, um, and I think he really leaned into, uh, leaned into that character in a way that, that even surprised me. So I was, I was pretty blown away by it for sure. You know, it's, it's interesting what you, you say about parenting. So I wanted to ask about, about Ray's part. And there's particularly the scene where, um, she gets very frustrated with her daughter, uh, you know, says fuck you to her and right. immediately regrets it. And as a, as a parent of two small kids, I, I found that moment incredibly relatable. And, and I, I, I thought it was interesting how you sort of balance out the way dads are intimidating in one way and mothers kind of, you know, tend to be the recipient of a lot more um, sure. uh, grief from children. So I was curious if you could speak to, um, you know, how, where did that moment come from in her performance and sort of the balancing of the paternal and maternal here? Sure, sure, sure. I mean, I think, you know, saying something like that to, to her daughter in that moment um, was, it's really the changing point for that, that character, you know, like she, in that moment, um, realizes that she has become someone she doesn't want to be. And I think that was kind of the, the, what we needed out of that moment. And Ray is, I've just never really worked with somebody quite so talented as Ray. Um, she has so much experience, um, you know, in all the, in the TV world and, and, and the future world too. But, um, you know, that moment was, it all came down to like, there's this two minute buildup, three minute buildup of, of this argument that leads to that, that moment and the shift that needed to happen immediately following was such an important little beat, um, that, uh, you know, we had to, we did, we did it a few times. The car was really not working very well for us. And, and the, the one take where she really nailed it, the car actually died, um, as that was happening. So the car comes to a stop and she says the, the line and, um, immediately after, you know, she, I was like, Oh my God, that was it. And she's like, but the car died, you know, like in the middle of the tank and I'm like, we're using it. You know what I mean? And so, uh, we definitely kind of lean into that, but, um, but yeah, that was, that was her, that was her big, her big sort of, um, turning point. One of the things I, I really enjoyed about the film were the aesthetic choices that you make. There's some sort of, you know, almost late fifties period staging. There's what feels like some late eighties, early nineties. I think we're of a similar age. So stuff we recognize from our childhood. Uh, And I'd I'd love to hear about your process for finding the right locations and designs and things like that. Sure, Bernard. Um, Well, I think the look really comes down to, to, to my collaborations with two people, my production designer, Molly Wartell and uh, my cinematographer, Ed Wu. And, uh, the three of us had such a good time sort of building out this world. Um, and, uh, with our, with, uh, obviously the, the whole rest of the team as well, but, um, but those two were integral and in sort of like the way in which we were presenting this world in which we kind of internally kept coming back to this idea of like a, like a, like a, like a snow globe, like environment where like everything is, is, a is related, but like, um, you know, all encapsulated in its own little cosmic universe. Like the movies to sort of has its own world. Like it's not really our world. It's sort of like some version of a planet that's just like our world, but kind of off. Um, and, uh, and we really tried to lean into that. The thing about the movie is that, you know, it really takes place in three different time periods all at once without telling you. So it does take place in 1968, 1990 and 2022 without sort of revealing that, you know? Um, and so there was a delicate balance there where we didn't want to lean too heavy into one or the other, but we wanted to play in this world of nostalgia. And I think Molly was particularly good at sort of, um, honing in on that world in terms of what are the designs that kind of carry us because the nineties are influenced by the sixties and, you know, so forth, like there is influences and there's, there's through lines to be drawn. And, and of course she's, you know, professional with that kind of, she knows her stuff. And so, um, you know, these patterns that we were leaning into in the color palettes and so forth, um, was really important to us. And, and, and also frankly, really fun. It was a good fun challenge. Like how can we invent this world that, by the end of the movie pays off and you can sort of watch the movie again and be like, wait, there's, they're playing a game boy, but also like 
there's a dress code at the school and like, you know what I mean? Like yeah. things like this that are, um, you know, kind of multi, multi-generational, I guess. One of the other uh, design choices I thought was really great was the sort of the, the do-it-yourself aesthetic of the Bill Nye-esque TV show. And I'm you know, curious what inspired you there. Yeah, Bernard, um, Bill Nye inspired me there, <laughs> for sure. I mean, I was a huge Bill Nye fan. Like, so was I. <laughs> such a huge Bill Nye fan. And actually, I was told last night that he's here at South by South. Oh. And I'm like, I got to. He's, he's got to see this gotta, movie. Yeah, I know. I'm like, I'm getting him a ticket. Um, I don't know how to get in touch with him, but I got to figure it out. Um, but yeah, he. Uh, I, it was such an inspiration to me as a kid. Uh, I think if I wasn't an artist, I would be uh, a scientist. Um, I do think there's a lot more overlap there than I think. Uh, the world gives credit for. There's so much creativity in both fields. Um, and I think that Bill Nye, like I would get home from school and watch Bill Nye. I liked it so much. Do you know what I mean? Like I, I, was, I was the same. Kid. <laughs> <laughs> so that was, uh, that was an easy inspiration to draw from. I, there was so much sort of fodder in my brain to, to play with in that sandbox. And, um, and uh, yeah, I think it was important to approach science in this kind of innocent way in the movie, you know, and I think there's an innocence to the way in which the DIY aspect of the sci-fi part of the movie comes into play, you know, like, uh, with like this rocket ship and so forth. And these things that are happening, like, um, you know, to really bring it down to earth, uh, you know, the DIY aspect of it is really just character. It's character building because you see the unique handmade aspect of these, these objects and, realize that oh my god Cameron actually you know this character built all these in his garage he hand painted that little you know obviously it's our art team but like he it, it all comes down to like the the compassion he has for teaching and for giving and for sort of the subject of science so um but in that way you almost you almost like feel for him because it's like his whole show was him you know and it's taken away from him so um yeah that was that was kind of a, yeah, again, a fun sandbox to play. One of the things I appreciated thematically is that um, it feels like there's a real element here of, of particularly Jim's character coming to appreciate the good, even if, you know, life didn't work out exactly the way he wanted. I think you see it a lot in the way he, he's gone back to watch old episodes of his show and the right. darker moments that I really appreciated. And I'd love to hear you speak to your intention there. Yeah, for sure. It, it is interesting. Like, I often make films like about older people uh, and I don't know where that comes. I remember my dad a few years ago, uh, he was like, I I made a short film about sort of similar themes. And he was like, Colin, like, he's like, you shouldn't even know about this stuff yet, (laughs) you know? But I think like, I think once you get, not even once you get to a certain age, I think I've always I, I, I'm like a very nostalgic person. Like I'm always looking back. I think I'm, I'm looking forward to, and I sort of has, have aspirations looking forward, but, but man, do I love like going to places I went as a kid, you know, going back to that, you know, to, to the library I used to go to or the park or, you know, my parents still live in the same house that I grew up in. So I can like go to my room, you know, and then that kind of thing. And I, I, I find like a certain amount of, joy in that, I guess. Um, but I think as far as like, you know, this sort of aspiration aspect and like measuring success aspect and being okay with where you are now, I think is, um, you know, it does come down to that kind of aspect of like, yes, you can live in your own sort of dream state, um, reality. Um, but I think it's important to sort of like consider how, your younger self might consider you now. Like, I think my younger self would be like, man, you made a movie. That's cool. Like, good job, you know? And and yeah, imagining what it might be like to talk to your younger self and learn from your younger self or your, or your future self, you know, Um, it's all kind of threaded into the movie somehow for sure. Yeah. I mean, I'll say, I, I think that that element really spoke to me. I'm someone who, who now takes my kids on the same trips I used to, yeah, to go on as a, as a kid cool. myself, but I, I gather we're, we're coming to the end of our time, but I, I, I did want to say congratulations. I thought the film was great. I, I hope an awful lot of people get a, get a chance to see it very soon. Thanks, Bernard. I really appreciate it. And it was great to talk to you.